Hi everyone, just before we get this next history hack outing going, we would just like to extend the most incredible thanks to everybody for the support you've given us so far. The podcast has passed 1 million downloads, which has completely blown our minds. So from Alex, Zach, myself, all the guys down the pub, we just want to say thank you so much. And to keep doing what you're doing, spread the word, tell your friends, like, subscribe, review. Remember, there's a Patreon, it's got its own discord channel now where there's chat and things on it there's ko-fi for dropping us a tip for an episode you'd like there's the bookshop where all the latest books from our great guests are and of course just tell everybody about us because the next million downloads we hope will come a lot quicker and who knows what is going to come up in the next year so thank you once again i'm going to stop waffling here's the show Hello and welcome to History Hack. Boney here. We have got a fantastic episode for you and we have a fabulous guest for you today. We are joined by Shelley Puhak and we are going deep, deep into Germany back in the day because we're going to be talking about the Dark Queens, two great medieval queens in sixth century France. We got a bit of Germany coming on. But who is Shelley? Well, she is a poet and writer, including books such as Harbringer and Guinevere in Baltimore. But that's enough from me. Shelley, how are you? How have you been? Where are you? What's going on? Hi, Matt. I'm well. I am just outside Washington, D.C., and I'm really excited to talk to you about these two queens. Yes, it, I, I find these episodes about the queens, we tend to have forgotten the most interesting because you just end up buying a load of books about them later and going down very fascinating rabbit holes. So I'm, I'm excited for this and looking forward to what you're going to be pointing me at today. But before we get going, let's set the scene before we dive into the lives of these women. We're talking about Europe at the start of the sixth century. What is that like? So this is just an incredibly fascinating time. Right now, Roman power has shifted east to the capital of Constantinople and what we now call Byzantium and taking over the former Roman province of Gaul, we have a tribe called the Franks. And in Spain, we have another tribe called the Visigoths and Italy will be taken over by yet another tribe called the Lombards. And we have some other tribes, Saxons, Bavarians, Thuringians running around. We do have a church and the Franks and the Visigoths have all converted, but many of the others are still in the process of converting. The church is divided into two sects and the sect that will become Catholicism is still in flux. And it's puzzling over things like whether women can participate in mass, whether priests and bishops should be celibate, what constitutes incest and what religious communities like monasteries and convents should be like. So that's all in flux. And it's probably important to know too that there's been a huge climate change after a volcanic eruption, a series of them in the middle of the century, which caused widespread famine. And the bubonic plague has also started making the rounds in the 540s. So we have a lot of chaos and we're in a period of just kind of intense transition and transformation. I love this period because it's there's just so much going on. And then at the top of it, you've got the church literally pulling itself apart. But we're not going to talk about that because we're going to talk about someone who a lot of people like me probably have heard of, but we've heard in a very specific context because we're going to start with Brumhild. So what do we know about her early life and why did she marry a Frankish king? So she is the youngest daughter of the Visigoth king of Spain, and he has no sons, and so he has raised his daughters accordingly. We know she's very well educated, and we also know that her parents enjoy a political partnership. So her mother's a very powerful queen and serves as an advisor and has her own kind of factions and lands, which... It's, it's, I guess, very formative, you know, for her in terms of what female power looks like. And then she's going to be married off to a Frankish king in hopes of securing a marriage alliance. So she's not German. She's not. I'm sorry, Wagner all. fans. She's not German. She's not. Okay. <laughs> 
we'll come back to that i'm sure you said spanish and i wasn't expecting that i've i've got my notes and i still wasn't expecting that so dear listener this is me flummoxed what was her husband like and i guess when we talk about marriages in this time especially at the sort of top of of tribes and things was there any love was it a happy marriage do we know or can we know i'll tell you a little bit about her husband first so sigibert is one of four brothers and he's supposed to be or seems to have been very ambitious and very cultured. He's really, really eager for this match because he's marrying above his station. So he's negotiating for her hand and considers her quite the catch. And all of his brothers seem to have had a series of marriages and extramarital affairs. That seems to be what the Frankish kings do, but he seems not to have done this at all. If he did, he was extraordinarily discreet and he seems to have been very faithful to Brunhild. He was so discreet in fact, that there were even questions of like, maybe he was, didn't like women, or maybe he was going to be, be a monk. But once they're married, they seem to have had a really good working relationship and he evidently cherishes and respects her. So we can't really know if there was true love there, but I would say as far as an early medieval marriage went, this one would be considered, you know, pretty good match. That sounds really nice because Normally at this point in, in these discussions, you start getting- <laughs> The wheels fall off the wagon, yeah. <laughs> but, no, but it seems that... to have been very happy. He was thrilled with her. He seems to have just like adored her. Which we like to hear, especially when a man's marrying up. It's always a, <laughs> it's always a good thing. Let's, let's spread the conversation out a bit. So what is going on in the Frankish world at the time? Because it's not- particularly peaceful place. So they're, they're in the middle of quite a tumultuous patch, aren't they? They are. Sigibert, as I mentioned, is one of four brothers. And the problem the Franks have is that they haven't quite figured out the system of inheritance. So when a king dies, any son of his, legitimate, illegitimate, gets a portion of the kingdom. And then they get to fight it out over who gets what. And then if one of the brothers should die, then they fight again to, to redivide his land. So they're essentially in a kind of a constant state of war. And Sigibert is in particular been battling with his youngest brother, Chilperic, off and on kind of continuously. So they're always invading one another. So for the common everyday farmer, you often don't know who your king is because cities and land are sort of switching hands back and forth. I was going to throw in another question there, but I'm not, because I think we're going to come up to the moment, because it's, I keep thinking of Stardust when people describe that to me. The king's dying, brings the sons in and goes, right, you're all going to guess a bit, but off you go, see if one of you can rise to the top. That's it essentially can. it, yeah. yeah. That's just one of my favorite movies. I try to squeeze that in whenever, whenever I can. So with this sort of very complex power dynamic within the court, how much sort of power does Broomhilde have as if, you know, if her husband's sort of beneath her in the great scheme of medieval societal <laughs> structures? How does she fit into this? Because does she have much say in it? Or is she, now that she's married, is she sort of shimmied off to the, off to the side? Well, surprisingly, she is able to wield quite a bit of influence. She obviously has to build alliances in her new land, but her mother has been a good model for that. And we have records of men going through her to appeal to the king, suggesting she's wielding you know, quite a lot of influence as a political advisor. And these aren't just in matters of what we might expect like a queen to intervene in terms of begging for mercy, for example, but in matters of, of war and also in terms of financial decisions, things like taxes and such. Just to sort of look, look around, what is actually happening to the Franks at this time? I'm not a question that's on our list, so we can skip this one out. Mm -hmm. But what is happening to the Franks at the moment? You've got four brothers sort of fighting over their patch, but what's happening externally as well? Is, is there external pressures or is it just an inward facing civil, civil dispute over the kingship? So this is like a great question because for the Franks, being, you know, a warrior king involves conquest. You have to conquer something. And these brothers' father has essentially expanded the boundaries of Francia. So he's he's moved, you know, 
quite far east. The Huns and then the Avars have been vanquished in their earlier years, so they really have no one left to fight with but one another. I mean, they certainly still deal with some incursions, and then they'll, you know, every once in a while invade Italy. There will be those sorts of issues, but especially now that there is an alliance with Spain, the Visigoths in Spain, they're dealing with sort of these lower level tribes. And most of these tribes have become like tributary kingdoms. So they do have to deal with some rebellions, but essentially now they're left. If, if you want to be a conqueror, you have to take something from your brother. So the traditional, when the piggy bank's running low, you invade Italy. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a regular thing, even in, in the sixth century. It is. Uh, that's that's fascinating because it's th these sorts of periods when you know a tribe or a kingdom has sort of expanded to the point where they're secure ish and they start looking inwards and start pulling themselves apart a bit that's that's always when you know we we end up talking about them nearly 2000 years later which is great let's introduce somebody else ragund am i saying that right i say it radagund but you know radagund. You may be saying it correctly because I think with a lot of these pronunciations, no one really knows. Hmm. I just am very wary of pronouncing a powerful woman's name wrong, even many <laughs> she years. She should after. be. <laughs> so, who was she? So, now she's a saint. And incidentally, you can still visit her crypt in Poitiers if you are so moved. But she was a Thuringian princess. So, she belonged to one of these tribes that had been conquered by Sigebert's father. And she was captured in battle. She was around five or six and she was raised to be the young wife. Uh, you know, I think it was his fourth wife. Don't, don't quote me on that. But so she's essentially raised in captivity to become his wife. And she's a very devout Christian. She hates her husband, understandably, because he is essentially her captor. And she would, for example, leave the marital bed to lie on the cold floor and moan and pray for repentance. So as one can imagine, it, it was probably not the, the sexiest thing to do. And she also engaged in these really horrific mortifications of the flesh. So she loved like burning herself and wearing hair shirts and branding herself, beating herself, all of these things. And eventually she leaves the king. And after a very public struggle, she ends up becoming a nun and founding her own convent. And it will survive up until the French Revolution. But she remains very powerful in this convent. And she ends up befriending Brunhild and helping her and her husband secure an alliance with the Byzantine Empire. That's pretty extreme to avoid your husband. I mean, he seems like he was not the nicest man in her defense. But also, options are limited. Mm. I, I, I'm genuinely shocked. I was not expecting <laughs> you to go there with that. Yes, granted, the you know, con conquering types tend to, especially when they've picked someone at five to be a wife a bit later on. You, you, you kind of know where that's where that's going. But what happens to? Broomhill's husband, whose name you've mentioned a few times, and I'm not even going to try to butcher it because. Well, you don't need to I've learn got, it I've because. Got, I've, I've, got I've got you. Well, and he leaves the scene relatively quickly because he is assassinated thanks to Brunhild's great rival and sister in law, Fredegund. Okay, so things are starting to get interesting. But before we move on to Fredegund sure. properly, what happens with Broomhild? This is my. my Wagner fanboying comes to that that sounds bad but I like the music not the man let's that's, no, a, di no. that's, a, that's a different that's a different that's a different podcast <laughs> <laughs> and certainly it's interesting how all of all of this these women's lives kind of get grafted onto Norse legends and end up as the opera so Brunhild's forced into a convent after her husband is assassinated by her brother-in-law, who's obviously going to take over his lands now. And it's a very common way at the time to get rid of excess royal women. You shunt them off to a convent. So then she plots a second marriage and the second marriage offers her a way out of the convent, but it's also a part of a larger plot against her brother-in-law because she ends up marrying his son, her nephew, and together they launch a rebellion against him. You know, as one does. Yeah, yeah. 
that it, it all these things start to seem like the, the plots of sort of really weak historical novels but you think actually in the power dynamics it's you know from her perspective who can she use to regain position regain that and then get i suppose revenge um george R. R. martin is not the first person to have thought all this stuff up is he no and i will tell you this story is so ridiculous that if it were fiction I often say like most of this would be edited out as being just too unrealistic. Like you can't have this many marriage plots and assassinations, but so that's part of the appeal of, of this history for me was just, it's so larger than life. It's some of it's just absolutely incredible. So let's get on to Farragut. So you mentioned, or you refer to her even as the slave queen. So I'm, I'm intrigued how, how she gets into this sort of, position of power from such i don't want to say low beginnings because that's not necessarily how slaves can begin but how how, how does that happen so anyway. she is a palace slave in a neighboring frankish kingdom and she starts out working in the kitchen and then she's promoted to a serving maid to the queen and we can assume that she is from relatively low beginnings at this time there are you know slavery is like it's not a permanent state of affairs. So certainly there are highborn people who are captured in battle and then they're enslaved and then they're ransomed off or people who are enslaved, but then they're able to marry out of the situation. So it's not necessarily hereditary. But in this case, after she becomes queen, a lot of people who are former slaves who then rise, they there's some record of them giving gifts or donations or helping out other family members or conversely talking about their origins. So if there was some great noble family in the background, we assume she would have deployed it, mentioned it, had it, mm-hmm. had it brought up to defend against a lot of the uh, slurs that were being, you know, people were speaking ill of her as, as essentially an upstart. So we assume that she probably came from either enslaved people or just very poor common people who were captured in battle because of her beginnings. And then she's the serving maid to a queen. She catches the king's eye. He sets aside this queen for her. She becomes his concubine or mistress. And then later she becomes his wife. So she literally goes from kind of the lowest of the low to the highest of the high. Who was the king? The king is Chilperic and it is Sigebert's younger brother. So Brunhild's first husband's younger brother. If you can follow that. Yes. So we're getting even more intertwined into this family. As, <laughs> so as they end can. up sisters-in-law. So Brunhild and Fredegan are sisters-in-law relatively so, early. So so while Fredegan is w- working her way up, Brunhild's trying to be packed off to a, a monastery. At which point does Fredegan start ruling? Because not only does she get the I want to say queenship that's the wrong word but you know what I mean she Uh becomes queen but then she also becomes ruler in in her own right so for a while she's just a very powerful queen and that's pretty amazing in and of itself that the king says that she's essentially like a co-ruler but then he is also assassinated there's a lot of assassinating of the kings happening here and uh, and then she's able to seize the the throne as regent for her very young son right so it's that ruling instead so something that we'd see not much later with say the first margarets and things like that ruling in, instead in, in england so she's has a son she has the heir but she takes that opportunity to to rule in his name and, and try to secure mm-hmm. his future okay. so then we end up with a situation where both women are regents for their very young sons, ruling neighboring kingdoms and battling one another, essentially fighting a civil war against one another. How does that go? I guess it depends from whose perspective. (laughs) (laughs) You know, of the two, Fredegan is the better military strategist. So she has to make do with a much smaller army And uh, she's starting off with a much smaller bit of land, but she makes the most of it. And she seems to be a genius at making the most of the element of surprise and positioning her troops for sort of maximum effect. So she's able to gain the respect of her troops, which is no small feat in this era, because even though people might be used to women as administrators, they're not, it's not common 
you know, we don't have records of women being in battle physically. So the fact that she's actually leading these men in battle and they're listening to her and not just for a single instance, like we often have that case where a queen has to step in because the king falls or, or something has happened, but repeatedly uh, really speaks to, I guess, her skill. And I guess with her background as well, she's she's built... I'm assuming here she's she's built that ability to yeah, com command a room to 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 drag people along with her because I guess you would have had to have done that from an early age as opposed to Brumhild who's coming from a much sort of top top down as opposed to bottom up upbringing. So we've got our two queens here battling it out. You've said it depends on whose side we want to be on. I'm gonna trying to stay neutral, even though I've been going on about Wagner for the last 20 minutes. How does it end for them? Does one of them win or do neither of them win? I think it's a case where neither of them win. Um, okay. I don't want to give it all away, but yes, one we, of them we, ends we, up- We don't want to go buy the, buy the book, folks. Please buy the book. But um, one of them ends up dying peacefully, if a little too conveniently in her bed. And the other one is executed in an absolutely horrific fashion, possibly the most gruesome public execution of a female royal ever, at least, you know, documented. And after both of their deaths, Fredegund's son ends up taking over, but he works to erase both of them from history, his own mother and his aunt. Hmm. To find out more, go to the History Hack Bookshop where you can buy Shelley's book and find out all about that. But let's let's sort of twist it around. How do you find out about women in this period? Grant, granted, we've got two quite powerful women who's didn't get erased from history as as much as the boy would have liked to. What sort of sources come through? I've got a note here saying that the, the dynasty's written out on papyrus and things like that, but these little sort of tentacles and almost whispers of history, how, how have they lasted a, a millennium and a half to us today for you to piece back together? So we're really lucky. There's an estimate that around 99% of the sources from this time period were lost. And some, those that do survive, survive because they were copied over and over and sometimes, you know, accidentally left in with other church documents. And we end up with two contemporary sources for two men who are eyewitnesses to a lot of this. And they're able to give us some really great gossip, but also like dialogue and weather. And, you know, this is what the room looked like. And these are what you know, these people said and who was gathered where. And so one of those accounts is by Gregory Bishop of Tours, and the other is by a court poet named Fortunatus. And then we also have some surviving letters that were written by Brunhild. And we also have ones that rulers were writing to the Queens. And we end up with some historical chronicles that were written shortly after their deaths, but they preserve a lot of their exploits. And then a lot of bits and pieces of their story come down to us garbled, but we have them essentially preserved in bits like Wagner's opera, The Ring Cycle, or Shakespeare's Macbeth, or fairy tales about evil stepmothers, or even people argue, you know, Circe and Game of Thrones. So there are some bits and pieces of their stories that are so compelling that they essentially have kind of wriggled their way into our popular culture. Does it help that this is in what will become France. It, it, the, the Franks are quite a modern modern tribe when it comes to organization, things like this, even, even before Charlemagne. Do you think that's probably helped? Because, you know, Gregory of Tours, I think, wrote every single thing he ever heard down. <laughs> that was <you> annoying, know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you think as, as a bishop, he'd have other things to do, but... No, yeah. but he's like, I had dysentery. Let me tell you all of my symptoms, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In detail. So I, I guess that sort of that sort of helps. But for for you coming to it as a as a writer, and I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the the poet aspect to it. I'm picking the um, what you can place down to contemporary sources versus the yeah millennium and a half of mythologizing about these women. How do you approach that? Because I I could imagine it's quite easy to maybe grab some of the more flowery bits of prose because some of the things that are written about these women are absolutely beautiful how do you restrain yourself as a poet 
I had to be really mindful of the biases of the men that were writing about them and kind of take a critical look at everything because again it's such a larger than life story and as you say there's there's these like flowery bits and you know if you go by what was written for example you know Brunhild's on her wedding day is essentially you know a second venus and we, you know we have all of these these sort of ridiculous comparisons that can't possibly be true so it really was a matter of just kind of sifting and sifting and sifting and as far as how it re, you know links back to the work I've done as a poet, I think poets always are in search of that like one perfect defining detail. And, you know, historians are essentially two. That's sort of one story or anecdote or something that that explains a lot more, you know, if you can compress everything. And sometimes there are also these details that that give away so much about someone's personality that they essentially help do the hard work of telling the story for you. Yeah, that, that must be such a fun exercise to, to go through because you know getting getting to that that thing that allows you to I suppose contextualize them as much as anything else within within a time and place must be a fascinating journey. It's a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I'm going to just throw this one in as as, as here. Who did you prefer as you got to know these two women? Oh, the team. Or, or, is, or is that asking like choosing your no, kids? No, yeah, it's like choosing your kids, but there is like this team Brunhild or team Fredegun. And I think it depends on the day because when I'm feeling very like go underdog, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's Fredegun, but sometimes, you know, with Brunhild, I'm like, she's very organized. Can everybody just listen? Can you just sit down and listen? You know, <laughs> she has a plan. Why will no one listen? But then I've also gotten the question like who do we think through better parties so it's like you know who do you want to be friends with or who do you want to so I'm, I'm going to say you know team Brunhild if I have to attend the party or talk to her <laughs> team Fredegund if you want to have like a really wild time and have like a great story if you survive you know to tell your tell your kids so I think one safer bet one much much wilder of a time one will give a hangover. One will give you a very short, sharp experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm intrigued by this because it's, I, I love, I love sort of looking past the, the sort of the easy stereotypes that we, we have for these things. And, you know, we, when it comes to Brumhild, you know, we have this image of usually a large woman on stage with the, the, the helmet shouting at you um, in, in German, which is usually an experience. But thank you so much for, for taking the time with this and, and, and helping us dig down because it's become a bit of a stereotype, hasn't it? This, this image of, of this woman in Wagner that you don't get a sense of her. Yes, it's quite magnificent what, what, you, what you hear and what you see, but there's more to it than that. And I think, you know, even in the short time we've had to say, because we don't want to spoil the books, people, go buy the book, is quite something. So thank you for that. And I guess, how, did you have the music on in the background or did you, or was it something? Occasionally, like? occasionally I did, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good to know. Keep, keep, keep your focus. Would it be in, in opportunity to ask what you have, what you're working on now? Or is that, is that secret we should look for? Closely to guarded you're... secret. Mm. No, I'm just terribly superstitious. And so when something is in its uh, early stages, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of scared to talk about it. I do have a poetry collection coming out later this year. So um, I'm, I'm kind of excited to, you know, look forward to like reading from that and promoting that. But the next, the next nonfiction book is, is still in its uh, like most fledgling stage. So I daren't speak its name. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> we shall keep quiet and we shall look forward to that. We'll have to have you back for when that one drops as well. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And I just, I love any opportunity to talk about these, these two women. I wish more people were aware that we had two women running around, running Western Europe, you know, 1400 years ago. I think uh, it kind of demands that all of us maybe do a little bit better in terms of women and leadership roles today. Charlemagne didn't just pop out of nowhere. Fully was, farmed, yes. There was, there was a lot that came many, many years before him. Shelley, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org. 
where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 